Good morning. It's, it's great to see so many people come out today for uh, today's uh, Bigner lecture. Uh, to remind everybody, we are taping this lecture for uh, people who couldn't make it here today and for you to go back and, and refer to it in the future. Um, this series has been going on since uh, November of 2013, and it is in honor of uh, Eugene Wigner. Uh, it's the series in science, technology, and policy. Uh, it's organized by our corporate fellows. And today, uh, we are continuing on the tradition of this, this very important lecture series. And the goals of this lecture series is to inveg invigorate scientific discovery, to spur technological in innovation, and to initiate productive scientific policy debate. Um, this one, for those of you who are, are new to Oak Ridge and don't know the history of Wigner, uh, he was a very uh, important um, scientist in his own right. Uh, he was a chemical engineer by training and a physicist by inclination. I, I always like that, that description of him. He won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1963 for atomic theory, and he was the founder of nuclear, the field of nuclear engineering. He, what served as the model that actually started out this laboratory and its long history of the strong coupling of basic and applied research, which we continue to this day. And he became the research director of Oak Ridge National Laboratory, which was then called the Clinton Labs from 1946 to 1947. And again, those of you who are not familiar with the history of Oak Ridge, uh, the original mi uh, mission for the Clinton Laboratories was to do a pilot scale separation of plutonium for the war effort. And there was a lot of work being done in separation science, which has continued today, to develop uh, isotopes for the nation and the world's use. Researchers tackled major, major challenges in metallurgy and materials chemistry. And if you look at the laboratory today, those origins are very much in the forefront of this laboratory's current mission. So today, we, I have the distinct pleasure of uh, introducing C.N. R. Rao. Uh, he is following in the footsteps of many of our distinguished lectures that we've had over the past year and a half. Um, he is from the Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research in, the, in Bangalore, India. He is a distinguished professor there. Uh, he is a national research professor, a Linus Pauling research professor, and honorary president of the university. He is an honorary professor at the Indian Institute of Science where he spent time, and his background has uh, interest in solid state and materials chemistry and structural uh, chemistry. So he is a chemist. Right, so we all we we cheer for chemistry. Okay, um, he's also an advocate for um, science education. Has written a series of books uh, on chemistry for children. Now, if you look at his background, I, I have rarely read a CV that is as chock full of honors and distinctions as as your CV. And so I'm not going to go through all of these, but I will give you a little bit of a flavor of of the tremendous scientific record of Professor Rao. He got his PhD in chemical physics from Purdue University. He told us last night at dinner that it took him 17 days to go from India to England by boat to get to the United States, which took another week. So, you know, this, this, he really wanted to come to the United States to go to, to graduate school. <laughs> And, and it's hard to believe, you know, that back in the 1950s, he just didn't hop a jet to come over. So he was very dedicated to coming over to the country to get his PhD. He did his postdoctoral research at the University of California, Berkeley. And then he returned to India as a young faculty member at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. Uh, he moved to the new uh, Indian Institute of Technology in Kanpur and soon became the head of the chemistry department. And he single-handedly developed new facilities for research in solid state and materials chemistry at this institution and built a research program in metal oxides. Then he returned to the Indian Institute of Science to build new departments devoted to solid state chemistry and to materials science. What's interesting is that he has made uh, profound 
uh, impact in many areas of solid state chemistry. Uh, he has uh, studied transition metal oxides, high temperature superconductivity, multiferroics, and nanomaterials. Even more amazing, he's the author of 1600, over 1,600 publications and 48 books. And when you look on, on the Web of Science, he has over 61,000 citations with an ind uh, H index well over 100. I think you said it was 123 last night. So it, it, he's had quite a distinguished uh, career and is still having quite a distinguished career. He's still publishing. Uh, he has a research group, you said, of 15 students, I think, still. So he's still very active. He has honorary doctorates from 65 universities. He has uh, been recognized with a list of honors that I'm not going to go through, but it includes the Knight of the Legion of Honor from France. Uh, he has the Bharat Ratna, the Jewel of India Award from India. He has the Raman Award in Physical Sciences. He's got the Marlowe Medal from the Faraday Society and the Royal Society of Chemistry Medal. And this is just, just a small fraction. He also has the Japan Order of the Rising Sun Gold and Silver Star. He's the fellow or an associate fellow of over two dozen national academies internationally. So that's really fantastic. And one of the most interesting one that he was telling us about last night, it was kind of in the line of, of the Pope coming to the United States today, is that he is on the Pontifical Academy of Science. I didn't know there was any such thing. But anyway, so he gets to meet with the Pope. <laughs> uh, let me see here. I'm st I still have cards. Um, he he uh, has a lot of uh, service to his country and to the world in uh, various advisory panels in science. And his lecture today addresses a very important area of science that aligns well with some of the science that we're doing here in material science. And this is uh, in an emerging family of materials that have captivated researchers around the world. And so today, I'd like to have us welcome Professor Rao as he presents his, his lecture on the inorganic graphene analogs. Okay. So thank you so much for your very kind uh, introduction. Uh, I've always heard of Oak Ridge, but this is the first time I've come here. And it is a matter of great pleasure that you have given me this opportunity to give a talk here. Uh, today, I could have picked many possible topics today for my, uh, uh, for, my uh, uh, for giving a presentation today, but I picked this topic mainly because I, I believe that this area uh, shows how, within a very short time, a topic in material science or physics and chemistry of solids can become uh, very prominent. Uh, we all remember graphene. Graphene was certainly very famous, became very famous in 2004, 2005, in the single sheet of sp2 carbons, the mother of all graphitic forms, because you can form graphite by stacking it, by roll it, make nanotubes, you can even make buckyballs out of it. The main reason it, becomes, it became very important is because of the extraordinary electronic properties, the energy of the electrons being linearly dependent on the wave vector near the crossing points in the Brousson zone, it is zero gap material. And of course, many other properties in the unusual quantum artifact, ballistic transport of carriers, and so on. So uh, when this happened, uh, many of us have worked on it. I continue to work a little bit on graphene and related materials. But it occurred to us at that time, why not work on other inorganic layered materials? For those who, have, who remember, inorganic layered materials like molybdenum sulfide and boron nitride have been known for a very long time. And these materials form the basis of doing analogs of nanocarbons of various kinds. For example, when fullerenes were uh, synthesized for the first time, my friend Harald Kroto and others, we immediately made, many of us, inorganic fullerenes. 
for those who may not remember, let me show you a typical picture of the uh, fullerene made here. Well, I guess uh, uh, I can't use the point area, but uh, niobium sulfide, tungsten sulfide, and some of these structures, fullerene type structures were made uh, even with inorganics. When nanotubes came, right away, a number of nanotubes of inorganics were made. I'm showing some very old picture of some sulfide nanotubes of molybdenum or tungsten that were made, or selenide nanotubes, uh, uh, very, very early. Since then, of course, inorganic nanotubes have been made in, in plenty. In fact, I wrote a perspective in 2009 in advanced materials uh, to uh, about the synthesis of a variety of inorganic nanotubes. Well, with this background, why not graphene-like materials? That's how I, I thought of. And in fact, I was one of the first to uh, get into it in uh, 2004, 2005. As soon as graphene uh, 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 became popular, uh, well, first, of course, everyone worked on graphene, looking at the uh, me uh, micro-mechanically cleaved uh, graphene. And here is what, what I'm showing here is a, a very simple uh, picture of a uh, various kinds of graphene you can make one uh, one layer two layer uh, you can do the AFM and you make you can make all kinds of devices out of this mechanically uh, cleaved uh, uh, graphene what we did in the as early as uh, uh, 2005 was to uh, make graphene by a number of other methods one was by lithium intercalation of molybdenum sulfide as also ultrasonication I have not mentioned here and also hydrothermal synthesis, high temperature synthesis. So we could find various ways chemically to make one or two or three layer uh, uh, molybdenum sulfide or tungsten sulfide type of uh, structures. And of course, the first thing you see is the, the 002 reflection of the molybdenum sulfide or tungsten sulfide will be missing in such a single or two layer materials. And Raman spectroscopy is also very, very, first thought be very useful. I'll come back to this in a minute. Well, we calculated at that time, around 2005, 2006, the band structure. And the band structure shows, of course, the bulk material in MOS2 is an indirect band gap semiconductor, while a single layer is a direct band gap semiconductor. And this was a, of some a great interest to us at that time. Well, a lot of work on electron microscopy. I'm just showing a couple of pictures. You could make single layer. These are actually uh, two layers, uh, uh, one, over the, one above the other. That's why you don't see the atoms as clearly. So a lot of electron microscopy has also been done on these layers. And we also did this at that time. Now, coming back to Raman spectroscopy, you can see the most important bands of these are the so-called E12G and A1G modes. And many, um, uh, we did uh, measurement of spectra of MOS2 uh, as a function of number of layers, and also one, a few others did too, including my friend Millie Dresselhaus. You can see the E12G mode as you increase the number of layers, there's a softening of the mode. And if, uh, if the, uh, if the uh, in the case of the A1G, if you increase the number of layers, there is stiffening of the mode. So the stiffening and softening of the these two bands in Raman spectroscopy uh, is something uh, very, very interesting, and a lot of uh, people have uh, since worked on that. And, and then you see the, the two, that, that was the ordinary MOH, MOS2. And ordinary MOS2 is the so-called 2H MOS2, uh, with a 2H type of polytype. These are the two bands I showed you about, I talked about. However, if you do lithium intercalation and make a single layer MOS2, that is no longer 2H MOS2. That is what was interesting. It's something known to solid state chemistry for many years, but I had forgotten about it. And that is the so called 1T MOS2. This 1T MOS2, 1T MOS2, which can make by lithium intercalation and exfoliation, are both metallic, unlike 2H MOS2, which is direct band gap semiconductor. So the properties of 1T MOS2 are very different. The coordination of molybdenum is octahedral instead of trigonal prismatic uh, in the case of uh, 2H MOS2. So everything changes when you go to 1T MOS2. In fact, soon I'll come back to this problem again of using 1T MOS2 for uh, some applications. 
It has very, very interesting properties. Uh, it's unfortunately, 20 MOS2 is a bit unstable. As you make it and keep it, uh, you, you can see, see it slowly transforming to 2HMOS2, quite often also giving another uh, polytype 1T prime MOS2 as well. But MOS2 has many properties that quickly go through in a few minutes. Some of the properties are well known. For example, if you take one layer or MOS2, it has a weak ferromagnetism like all nano materials. Graphene also has some weak magnetism. Uh, the saturation magnetization value is certainly very small. But what is interesting is, if you make a ribbon after that, the ribbons have much higher magnetization. Well, this is very well known in the case of uh, graphene. Graphene nano ribbons have been made uh, by a number of methods, but the ordinary methods of uh, making graphene nano ribbons is by chemical oxidation and so on. So it gets functionalized. So we made graphene nano ribbons by uh, uh, laser unzipping of carbon nanotubes. They are much better. They show increased magnetization. So recently we just done laser unzipping of MOS2 and WS2 nanotubes, and they also show nano ribbons with slightly increased magnetization. So the, they do show these magnetic properties, and they even show them uh, uh, in uh, uh, some magneto resistance, 2 to 10 percent of magneto resistance. But MOS2 also has uh, the zigzag edges, just like uh, 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 graphene, which of course do, does play a role in many things, including its magnetic properties and so on. Okay. Coming back to something very more recent, in the last three, four years, a number of unusual properties of MOS2 have been known. One of the most unusual properties is this uh, tremendous photoluminescence. If you take a single layer 2H MOS2, which is an indirect band gap semiconductor, unlike, which is not an indirect, indirect band, gap, band gap semiconductor, but a direct band gap semiconductor, it shows a very, very highly intense photoluminescence. And this uh, photoluminescence is something very unique. The minute you make two layer, that goes down. In fact, in fact the, uh, it is no longer uh, 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 luminescent, uh, the two layer one. So you need a, a single layer. And uh, in fact, uh, some of these uh, properties have already been exploited, exploited by some biologists, it looks like. But I myself have not done enough work in this except that this very amazing uh, photoluminescence that comes out of the uh, single layer MOS2. And also, very interesting surface. The surface of MOS2, 2H MOS2, is something very interesting. For those uh, who may remember, graphene, when it was made, and similarly, carbon nanotubes were made, we have looked at the interaction of molecules with these. For example, graphene, you will put an electron donor molecule in it, the molecule donates electrons to graphene. Similarly, if you put an electron withdrawing molecule like tetracyanoethylene, it withdraws electrons from graphene. So you can see the shifts due to this in the uh, uh, Raman spectrum of the graphene. So we thought we would do something similar. See, look at MOS2. To our surprise, what you see is when you put an MOS2, say, tetracyanoethylene, nothing happens. It can't withdraw electrons from MOS2. However, when you put a molecule like tetracyanoethylene, which is a donor molecule, it gives out an entire electron, so you get a radical cation of uh, uh, TTF. In fact, some more work has to be done in this kind of area where interaction molecules on surfaces of MOS2, uh, they are, we have not continued this work. We, have to, uh, we, we need to do much more in this area. A lot of work has to come out on field effect transistors, but you know, uh, the, one of the best papers in the, uh, that were published was by KISS and others in 2011. Uh, they showed an uh, uh, on-off ratio of 24 of 8 and a uh, very, very fairly high mobility of 200 uh, centimeters squared uh, <clears throat> per volt per second uh, with an n-type conduction. Uh, we have also made lots of these transistors. Uh, even a bad transistor you make has fairly good on-off ratios. Uh, in fact, it shows hysteresis effect because of moisture and uh, it is because of mainly charge trapping, and you can easily eliminate that uh, by eliminating the uh, uh, moisture. And wh what is interesting is even poor, not so good transistors one has made has fairly uh, good on-off ratios uh, with MOS2. So these transistors have been used for a number of things. For example, you can make IR detectors, 
uh, with MOAC2, where in fact a good infrared detection, as you can see, uh, it, uh, it shows a uh, very good uh, response, uh, a reasonably good response. Responsibility is quite reasonable and a reasonable quantum efficiency. And more interesting is that a large number of people in the last three years or so have looked at the uh, uh, gas sensor properties of these transistors, MOS2 transistors, for molecules like ammonia or nitrogen dioxide and so on. So MOS2 has, in fact, seen already uh, the graph as a single layer or two layer MOS2 has seen applications of various kinds, uh, whether it is commercial, like I'll say, but certainly very interesting applications have come out. One of the most interesting properties of MOS2 is what I'm going to mention now. It is because of the large spin orbit interaction that is of molybdenum, it splits the valence band at the K point of MOS2. Because of this splitting of the valence band and because of the lack of inversion symmetry in the single layer MOS2, you have in the, there are two valleys where the dynamics of charge carriers will be different in the two valleys. And not only that, the absorption of left and right circularly polarized light by carriers in the two valleys is also different because of the, because of the valley, what, what they call a valley dependent selection rule. So this is the, what, what is interesting is this is shown only by a monolayer, single layer. If it is bilayer, the minute you have a center of inversion, you lose that property. So a single layer, 2HMOS2 has some unique properties. One of them is this, where this valley physics that I mentioned just now, and also the tremendous photoluminescence that I mentioned now because of being a direct band gas semiconductor. Uh, so these are all something which are really noteworthy. A lot of applications that people have looked at are one in use in lithium ion batteries. There have been a fair amount of uh, uh, effort to uh, uh, use in uh, lithium ion batteries. There are some uh, work uh, we have done and some others have also published where use this single layer or two layer MOS2 uh, with, uh, to, for uh, reactions like uh, hydro desulfurization, uh, which MOS2 is known for. In fact, uh, this the layered MOS2 with or without dopants like cobalt or nickel uh, show fairly good uh, hydro desulfurization activity, uh, going thiophene, going to butane, for example. Now, one of the properties which I'm personally been very interested in the last few months, uh, last year or so, is the work uh, uh, where using MOS2 for the, water, water, for the water splitting reaction. You all know the famous uh, uh, drawing here. This is just a, a drawing that shows what properties or what electronic, how, what type of electronic levels must be there in a material for use for water splitting. You must have a conduction band which is more negative than the reduction potential of the proton. And the valence band must be more positive than the oxidation potential of uh, uh, water. So MOS2, for example, has the valence band and conduction band perfectly aligned for water splitting. Of course, CDS is quite good. Levels are good. Zinc oxide is very good. PiO2 is very good. So some are good only for one reaction and not the other. But MOS2 seems to be quite good. So when you look at the literature, you find there has been work on MOS2 particles, for example, people have used MOS2 particles for uh, 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 splitting water. So we have also done this using MOS2 nano sheets, using disensitized uh, uh, water splitting. You take a dye like eosine, and you excite it to go to a triplet state, then it picks up an electron from an amine, and this electron is transferred to MOS2. I've used graphene as a medium for transferring the electron, and here, the protons get reduced to hydrogen. So the, uh, uh, the, the eosine is a highly reactive species. That is why it, uh, the eosine anion, and it donates electron to graphene very easily. And this kind of a uh, uh, way of doing disensitized uh, uh, water splitting has been, we published a paper on that a couple, few years ago. And uh, it gave us a reasonably good results. For example, MOS2 alone, if you did MOS2 particles, People have reported it. very small yield, a few millimoles of hydrogen uh, you get per, per, uh, per hour, per gram per hour. 
and very small turnover factor. However, if you mix it with a little bit of re reduced graphene oxide, it was much better. So we therefore, instead of ordinary reduced, gra uh, reduced graphene oxide, we did nitrogenated reduced graphene oxide, which is much more conducting, which gave us a much better yield of uh, hydrogen, 10 millimoles, with a much larger turnover factor. With, uh, with an ordinary 100 watt lamp, if you use a 400 watt lamp, it is almost four times that. So I've just given a 100 watt lamp. Normally, we only use the uh, uh, just 100 watt lamp. So with this result, we said, well, why are we sticking to ordinary MOS2, 2H MOS2, which is a direct band gap, band gap semiconductor? Why not use the other MOS2, which is 1T MOS2, which you get by intercalation by lithium, which is metallic? In fact, we could do that. We could easily show. It is 1T MOS2 in terms of coordination, all the other properties. It is a metallic system. As I told you, this 1T polytype has a octahedral coordination of molybdenum. When we did that, we got much larger amount of hydrogen and nearly 30 millimoles, much better than the 2H MOS2. In fact, you can see the 1T MOS2 has different electronic levels compared to 2H MOS2 and we are going to donate an electron from the anion of the dye to the one of the YZ orbitals or so of the unoccupied YZ orbital of 1T MS2. In this kind of a process, we, we could get very good uh, hydrogen. In fact, uh, what we show is a comparison of what is known. Because what is known in the literature, what was known to us in terms of MOS2, RGO, composites, and so on, are very, very small activity of hydrogen. And once you go to highly nitrogenated uh, graphene, we got about 10 millimoles. And when you go to 1T MOS2, it, the 10 became 26, much larger than any other thing with ordinary 100 watt lamp. With a 400 watt lamp, it was almost 75. I didn't, I'm not showing that with a very ordinary 100 watt lamp. Now, if this is the case, why not do much better than 1T MOSC2? Because MOSC2 is also a 1T form, we can make it. In fact, when we did that, we see 1T MOSC2 uh, is a very, very high yield of hydrogen, nearly 62 millimoles compared to 30 in the case of 1T MOS2. And this is the largest amount of hydrogen any simple two-layer material has given us till now. All kinds of two-layer materials have been tried, but I think no one, no material I know can beat the uh, performance of this. But this has uh, seen this. Uh, this has seen been published. Uh, there are articles on it. Uh, we have recently written a frontier article on this uh, uh, in chemical physics letters and also an article in uh, ACS applied materials and interfaces, uh, which is a comparative study of graphene and MOS2 where we compare the, uh, the various types of results. Well, what is the, the story of MOS2 is not over. There are many other properties. One is, you know, very interesting field emission with low turn on. You can use them in supercapacitors, fairly high specific capacitors. And people have found in single layer MOS2 uh, new kinds of uh, quasi particles, so called trions. I'm not an expert. I'm not going to talk about that. A lot of physicists working on trions in, one, in MOS2. And the number of theoretical predictions uh, superconductivity is one. Uh, the ferroelectricity in one form of 1T is not 1T, but 1T prime. MOS2, and this experimentally yet to be done. Well, superconductivity is interesting. I'll come back to that in a minute, because if we can somehow apply a little bit of pressure on 1T MOS2, I, pre I, I feel MOS2 will be superconducting, but we have not been able to do that experiment uh, yet in our laboratory. I'll tell you why this is so. The last uh, one year, there have been revolutionary, unbelievable results coming out of layer charcogenite. Unfortunately, I did not, did not have time to put, a, put all this in, a, in, in the frames uh, in my talk today. I, had, I didn't have time, uh, but I will talk about it for a couple of minutes. There are many layered compounds, train, transmission, train, jalconites. A lot of work has been done. TAS2, TAS2, they're all 1T form. They're metallic. Of course, this is a well-known superconductor. A lot of work has been done on that, but nothing very exciting there. WTE2, on the other hand, which is, again, you can have two forms of WTE2, again, H and T type, WTE2. And this is something unbelievable. First of all, it shows around room temperature, 
uh, the, the uh, transition from N-type to P-type uh, uh, carriers is shows us a very interesting room temperature transition. That is what we have found. And, and we have just published a paper in the Journal of Physics recently. But more interesting is this enormous magneto resistance at low temperature this is shown. Bob Kawa in Princeton has published a paper in Nature and also a theory about that in PRL recently. And what is unbelievable is that uh, I've done a lot of work on magneto resistance. I worked on colossal magneto resistance, 90%, 100%. This is 500,000%, nearly 450,000% magneto resistance at low temperature. Is there something, you can't believe these numbers, but it's true. In fact, in a cruddy sample that I have in my lab that some students make, I measure it, I get 10,000%. And a good sample, good crystal, uh, MO, uh, MO, uh, I'm not about to eat it, WTE2 gives nearly 500,000%. I don't know, this is a, these are all the unusual things about this uh, layer of materials, uh, which I had never heard of. You see, I've been working on physics and chemistry solid for 50 and odd years. I've never seen any magnetic resistance and properties of this kind, values, it's enormous numbers coming out. Uh, this is one of them. Well, then another interesting thing, MOTE2, we have been doing a lot of work on MOTE2, I'll not talk about all that. What is interesting is, MOTE2, we put a very little pressure, not much, very diverse, very small amount of pressure, it becomes superconducting. It's not just been published by my friend, actually I should have published it too, but uh, my friend Claudia Felsa in Dresden has just published it. Claudia and I have collaborated a little bit on this MOTE2. It is really showing very interesting results. We predict, therefore, MOS2 must be superconducting if it is 1T form. And uh, all you need is to put a little bit of pressure. And uh, this is, as I told you, sometimes you know you, you get, get, get into a mess in experimental work uh, where you are more interested. When you get very interested in it, there's some mess comes in, some difficulty. MOS2 1T form is very unstable. It's very difficult to keep it stable. See, even as you make it, keep it, it goes on transforming to the 2H form, which is not a very nice thing. I would like to keep it stable, and I don't have a simple way of keeping 1T MOS2 in stable form and then put pressure and so on. We're not able to do that. So I somehow feel 1T MOS2 will be a superconductor at a slight on application of very little pressure. Well, a lot of other things, uh, of course, I, today I'm not talking about uh, all these topological insulators like bismuth selenide, because the entire layered, they're all layered, you see. That is why, you see, the layered, the reason I am giving this talk is how this entire family of layered material, including bismuth telluride, bismuth selenide, have given you huge and new physics and new chemistry in terms of synthesis, in terms of ordinary properties, in terms of new phenomena, like topological insulators uh, and so on. And uh, well, there are many questions. In fact, for example, one of the questions being asked, are topological insulators good catalysts for something? After all, they have surface conductivity and so on. Well, I'm looking into some of those problems uh, in our laboratory today. OK. I just trying to remind you, this is not to show the results as much as just to remind you, there are many other layered materials, gallium sulfide, gallium selenide, well known. Of course, I got into this long ago. Marvin Cohen in Berkeley long ago had predicted if you make a single layer gallium sulfide, gallium selenide, they roll, they will roll to form nanotubes, which is true. If you make a single layer without a substrate, you get nanotubes. We have published that in the JSCS some time ago. But if you put it on a substrate, you can make a, a very nice, uh, uh, you can measure properties, and you can see the single layer gallium sulfide, gallium selenide. We have studied the Raman spectroscopy as a function of layers of both gallium sulfide and gallium selenide. What happens is the layer dependence. We can study, make transistors out of it, uh, 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 and so on. And recently, there was theoretical prediction that gallium sulfide, if you put water on it, it should split into hydrogen. And in fact, just now, uh, we have shown that uh, that's true. Uh, it is not it's just to come out soon. Uh, water is immediately split by gallium sulfide into hydrogen. Not a very good way. It's not a, good way to produce hydrogen like MOS2, but the fact that it does is something that uh, some theoreticians have predicted. So there are lots of uh, very interesting other layered materials we, we should work on. I would like to spend a few minutes on something real cruddy and really low level 
ordinary layered materials, really what we call the uh, common man's layered material, boron nitride. Uh, in the other, you know, we're all right talking MOS2, GAS, and boron nitride has been known for a layered material for long. It's exactly like graphene, and you can make that in a number of ways. We made many years ago, there were not so many, five years ago, you can easily make just by reaction of boric acid and urea, under rare conditions, you can make boron nitride. You can even make single layer boron nitride, depending on various conditions you use. You can make boron nitride very easily. Of course, there are many other methods. I'm not going to review the methods. And you can study the microscopy of that. Uh, you can study all the other properties. Uh, you can use boron nitride single layer or two layer uh, as a, uh, as a uh, uh, incorporated uh, to make composites and show that if you put one, or lay one layer or two layer boron nitride, you'll be better off than putting bulk materials to make, uh, to uh, strengthen the uh, uh, composites. So th th this is also known. Well, this is one thing I would like to spend a couple of minutes on. Well, one of the things I have been interested in, you see, graphene is carbon, very nice. Car boron nitrate is exactly like carbon, except that it's an insulator. Is it possible to do something in between, combine the two, boron nitrate and graphene? Well, a lot of papers are coming, and a lot of my friends in this country elsewhere, they put in physics, uh, uh, phys when some physicists put boron nitrate, deposit graphene, you can do all kinds of composites of that kind. Well, of course, I'm a chemist, and I, I don't like to do that. I want to make things. So I, I won't talk about those things. And I don't like, like composites of that kind. Uh, I mean, I'm nothing against them. You, you can do it. But uh, I, you know, putting something in the other is not very clever. <laughs> and I, I, I think chemistry is very interesting. What has happened in the last few months in my lab is a completely uh, really revealing kind of thing that has come out of it. You first started making very simple synthesis. You make, you remember, bor boric acid and urea gives boron nitride, pure. However, if you take high surface area carbon, put these together, you get borocarbonitride. And of course, this is not a homogeneous compound, but on the other hand, it is very, very unusual. You can vary the composition of carbon with respect to boron nitride. And the property is very like crazy. And you can, depending on the surface area, for example, they are very high surface area compounds, 2,000 square meters per gram. And the conductivity will vary. Our band gap will vary depending on the composition. Uh, for those uh, who are avid chemists like me, you know, we chemists are a bunch of, you know, they are attached to the subject. We can't do a thing about it. And uh, like she was saying, uh, I just want to remind you, I had a very great friend of mine called Bartlett. I don't, I don't know whether anybody remember Bartlett's name. He used to be a professor at Berkeley before he died. He used to be earlier in British Columbia. He was an old Englishman, originally in, in England. Long ago, he tried to make a borocarbon nitride by a reaction of gases, methane, boron trichloride, and ammonia. Unfortunately, he wrote a little note in a, in a journal which nobody reads nowadays. But uh, I also did that. I repeated that. You can do that. Except he had no way to characterize them, you see, those days when he did it. Bartlett was a very great chemist. Uh, for those young boys and girls here, you know, as an old man, if you don't know, I'm 82 years old, some little bit uh, information of this guy. You know, Alan, Bartlett was the first one to make a noble gas compound, xenon compound. When Bartlett made a xenon compound, the entire myth of noble, noble gases being inert, inert gases was wiped out. There are no inert gases. We said, you know, although noblesse oblige, we all nobility obliges. So nobility, inert gases became noble compounds. We no longer called them noble. But poor man was never given a Nobel Prize. I mean, you know, he really, he got into the myth of rare gases being inert, you see. Poor, I'm talking about this. I'm just reminding you of history. Nothing to do with my talk. That is the man I'm talking about, Bartlett. He was a wonderful man. One of the finest human beings I've known. I guess you should lose, and I lose the Nobel Prize. You can become even nicer than before. Uh, uh, well, he, he should have got a Nobel Prize. Okay. Well, we have made borocarbonitrides by a number of methods. They, they have layered all kinds of layer structures. Uh, you can make single layer material, two layer materials, uh, all kinds of materials. Uh, in the last two months, I found the best way to do it is take a 
single layer graphene or a two layer graphene and react it and then you get a few big large layer borocarbonate. In the same sheet, you have domains of boron nitride, borocarbonate, carbon, you can vary the proportions of that. So you'll have unusual electrical properties. Unusual. They made transistors out of it as of last month. I'm not going to talk about that because I've not got good data yet. But we made transistors. But more than transistors, we've done many, many other things. Let me show you one. This Boroka high surface area, high selectivity of CO2 or N2. CO2 sequestration or capture, very, very high. In fact, the CO2 is about 65 weight percent at room temperature, 100 and odd weight percent at low temperature, and it's also high selectivity. You can get uh, fairly high uh, CO2 capture in this. And the cheap material, unlike uh, uh, people who work on metal organic frameworks, very expensive, this is a very cheap material. We have been able to make very good supercapacitors out of it uh, uh, with fairly good uh, specific capacitance. Uh, one of my friends has then shown it to be very good for oxygen reduction reaction uh, in uh, fuel cells, and also used as an anode in lithium batteries. And this is what I put it just four days ago, uh, six days ago, before I left Bangalore. I could only put this one, but didn't have time to put the data. See, the, after I found out the properties of these materials, I thought we should be able to make a borocarbon nitride, which is a very good catalytic catalyst for electrolysis of water. i tell you why. I was uh, doing all this, I, by the way, for those who may not know, I do artificial photosynthesis, with one of my main interests. I'm producing hydrogen in various ways. I only showed you MOS2, but I also do semiconductor heterostructures. I, mean, I had very great luck, uh, results as good as Ali Vas uh, the kind of results Ali Vizatos has from Berkeley. Very, very good results with the semiconductor heterostructures. And this good friend of mine from Israel came, hey, Ram, why are you doing all this? Why don't you just electronize water and get rid of it? Uh, do hydrogen? Why all this semiconductor heterostructure or MOH2? And well, you know, it sounded very good because after all, you can do photovoltaic electricity and electrolyze. But I told him it's not simple. Electrolysis of water also is a problem. You, there's a problem of over potential. You need a catalyst for the electrolysis of water. And uh, that's what these people use platinum. And there is no good. In fact, uh, when I was talking about it, there were two papers in Nature in the last six months. I don't know many of you have seen it as a new substitute for platinum in electrocatalysis. Well, there are one was a carbon nitride C3 and 4, along with some carbon quantum dots and all that. I said, no, 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 I borrow carbon nitride. That's it. And in fact, I've now been able to make the right kind of borrow carbon nitride, which gives the fantastic results. I have 100% paradigm. Uh, uh, Efficiency, excellent, as good as platinum for electrolysis of water. So this is another result. These are all layered materials. That's why I'm showing that result. Well, uh, somebody asked me yesterday, why are you only talking about sulfide, nitride, when you can also make oxides? Uh, in fact, we have made very nice uh, layers of uh, ferroelectric BI, BI40, A3012. Also, my Japanese friends in NIMS have also done that. We can make, I will not show the uh, so all the details of that, various kinds of layered units of this kind, which can probably be used as dielectric layers in photovoltaic cells and so on, but I don't work in those things. Well, uh, I, I, the, what, what I have tried to show here is now whether I can use these layers, a single one layer of boron nitride to do other things. So I've used them, for example, recently to, you know, as you know, Metal organic frameworks are very flimsy. They break up into crumble, into powder. So can I put a boron nitrate and grow on that uh, ZIF uh, or some other uh, ZIF-8 or some other metal organic framework? In fact, we have shown, for example, we can do that. We can have metal organic frameworks on boron nitrate or graphene, which retain the gas absorption properties, but are much stronger. We are continuing this kind of work in the laboratory. Well, outlook, what I would like to say is that, you know, when I started looking at graphene in 2005, 2006 at that time, 
I thought I was entering into a very fantastic area. Well, uh, of course, you always wonder why we all didn't do it first, but when only these guys in Manchester had to do it. But many of you who are young may not know, when I was a young graduate student here, even long before, I had this very dear friend, Millie Dressel House in MIT. Many of you know, Millie and I always share this story. You know, in MIT, in many places, 60 years ago, there were people trying to make single air graphene. And they would say, well, you know, I must have, but they had no way to characterize that. Even if they had made it, probably somebody had made it, but no, they would do to characterize it. There was no AFM, there was no technology available. But it is not new. The idea of graphene is not new. But it's an old idea. We saw, of course, the hands of the two Russians in Manchester. Uh, it was done. But no, of course, when that was done, I thought uh, it would be nice to do inorganic materials, just like we did inorganic chlorines, inorganic nanotubes. I must say, it's been very enjoyable. You see, there's the thing, life, all the science you do is not to do great science, to make life enjoyable for yourself. You see, what is, what the good science does it, makes you young, makes you happy, and also science comes up. And I've enjoyed this, working in science in this respect. And, uh, oh gosh, it is uh, very dark for some reason. But you see, this crazy guy here, uh, there is blocking one head there. You see, that head actually is a statue of Gautam Buddha, and he's walking around. There's a statue of Buddha. And can, these are all some of my students who have done a lot of work. Thank you so much. Got it on. Okay. So um, first, I wanted to thank you for the, the fascinating lecture. It went by very quickly. It was a lot of good thank science you. that was described there, and, and, and I'm sure we're going to have some good technical questions. Uh, before we start the technical questions, I thought I'd ask a couple general questions sure. of you. Um, when you were a young man and starting off in your career, okay, and started thinking about which area of science to go into, what made you go into the chemical physics area? Well, I, 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 when I was a very young man, when I was in school, actually, uh, in our school uh, in Bangalore in 1945, I still remember the year, I was exactly 11 years old, C.V. Raman came to our school, gave a lecture. You know, you know C.V. Raman was an exciting lecturer. He would hold on to his lap of the coat and shake it like this. And, like, and I said, I want to be like him, you see. I don't know why. I, I thought I should be. And that's how it started. But later, actually, it was like when I was uh, doing my, much later, a few years later, when I was in college, I read Parks of Nature of the Chemical Bond by Linus Pauling. Mm. And just then, in 1951, if you, I don't know whether you remember, he, I was told he made the, uh, determined the structure of the alpha helix. I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know what alpha helix was. But on the other hand, my God, people, if you can do all that, maybe that is what I should be doing. Because nature of the chemical bond, which I didn't understand, all was made on atoms, molecules, and chemistry, the one I was learning in school and college was nothing to do with it. It was a terribly boring uh, uh, chemistry. And I thought I must do the chemistry of the kind Linus Pauling is writing about. That is one reason I came away to this country. Oh, okay, okay. Well, you might notice by looking out on the audience, we have a pretty large cadre of early career professionals, right. uh, postdocs and graduate students. And, for somebody who's had such a distinguished career like you have, what kind of advice would you give these young people as they start their professions? Well, I only, you know, this is true in my life. I always had a tremendous passion to do something, to do something, I mean, whatever that was. And if you have that passion, don't give up. That's all I can say. I think nothing can equate the pleasure and happiness that you get by accomplishing what you really enjoy doing. I think it has been wonderful. Uh, doing that, and uh, 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 I, I enjoy publishing papers. To be honest, I was really, literally, I was taken away by, when I was young, I used to read a lot of books, and Faraday, Faraday said, you know, some young man asked Faraday, define science in simple words. Oh, it is nothing, he said, work, finish, and publish. That's all he said. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm holding on to it. I, th I think publishing is a word. You know, you see your name in print all the time. God, what a wonderful 
uh, it, uh, I feel very enthused, even though when I write a paper. I, I think it's been, uh, it, it, the, the, these have been stood uh, uh, by me very, very nicely. So, so when you write a book for children on chemistry, what kind of storyline do you put well, behind we, it? We, we, in fact, my wife helps me a lot in uh, writing for children. Uh, there are different types of things we have done. One, the kind of thing is uh, written on general science, mm -hmm. some books. It's published in several languages in India. It has also come in uh, languages like Chinese and Portuguese and so on. Uh, and more than that, understanding chemistry. I've written a little book for a school teacher who still doesn't know much chemistry. Just started to learn chemistry. What is the chemistry you want to teach that child? Uh, I, I'm more worried about that level and not to specialization, uh, specialized uh, courses in chemistry. I've written books like that. And recently, when Nano World came, everywhere I went, what is nano? It became an excitement. Every child was asking, what is this nano, nano? So I wrote a little booklet for uh, what is nano world, nano world. So very simple words with pictures. And it has now been translated in many languages, including Swedish and so on. So I, uh, I've enjoyed uh, doing that. Uh, in general, I've enjoyed writing. I think it's a very, uh, if you start loving writing, love to write, I think it's a wonderful uh, thing to do. But most people are very lazy. They don't like to write. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess what I'd like to do now is open it up to members of the audience. And um, is there any questions that we'd like to ask Professor Rao? Thank you. Um, one, one thing I wanted to say was uh, Harry Croto was here for a Vigner lecture, and he said the same thing that you just said about passion. So I wanted to. I mean, he's a very good friend of mine, very close friend. I imagine so. So my question was, um, you had talked about uh, not seeing uh, graphene because you didn't have the tools like AFM to see it. Uh, what materials are we missing out on right now that we don't have the tools to see it, and what tools do we need? Well, I, 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 there must be several types of nanomaterial, I think, which require better tools than what we have now, I can think of. Uh, looking at interfaces particularly and so on. I think uh, uh, interfaces will be very an important area in nanoscience. Uh, uh, other than that, I would like to see re readily available atomic resolution microscopy where, suppose I put a phosphorus atom in a sulfur. I always want to know where the phosphorus atom is. It is not easy to do that now. I would like to see microscopies of that kind come in. I'm facing that practically in my lab, having made some unusual materials. Uh, uh, I'll tell you what, what, what the material is. I am now what is doing what is known as allovalent uh, substitution. You know, if you have an oxide, normally zinc oxide, you replace the metal. That is what most people do. People always replace metals in, in organic media. That is useless. Metals only change the conduction band, unoccupied levels. It doesn't change the electronic structure much. However, you change the anion, like oxygen, not by Isovalent anion like sulfur, or anion oxygen by nitride and fluoride, equal amounts. That you see, the zinc oxide that I make is orange colored zinc oxide. And the, black, the band gap has come down, and it's a completely different properties. So for example, I want to see that nitrogen where it is. There must be a way of doing that. It's not easy now to do that type of microscopy. I'm told it is possible, it's not easy. I would like better microscopies coming in. I'm sure it will come, that, that one of them. And already, as you know, confocal microscopy in biology has improved so much. Now we are photographing all the neurons and all the uh, nanoscale uh, imaging of biological things. So I, can, I, I expect more imaging uh, uh, to improve our uh, studies. Another question? Well, you know, I'm, when I started science, science was a hobby of a few. Not so many people were there. Now it's highly competitive. You know, a paper I would write and get it published in Physical Review or JSAS, the same paper won't get accepted today. It's become highly demanding. 
I think we are very hard on ourselves. Scientists demand so much of themselves, the measurement, the quality of measurement, the quality of everything. It's unbelievable. And uh, also the competition, with, uh, with all due respect to uh, some of the people, for example, China, coming out with so many publications, has made this competition very difficult because uh, you know, the number game has become uh, is against you. Whatever you do has been done by somebody, at least they were nibbled at something. Uh, it becomes very difficult to compete. And so young people, that is why, have to know how to pick an area of research. I had to do that in India. When I went back, you know, I couldn't do the, I had done electron diffraction of gases and lots of spectroscopy in this country for my PhD, postdoc. When I went to America, what gases, what diffraction, nothing. So I had to, that's how I started solid state chemistry, which within Indian facilities I could do something. So I think I always uh, advise young people that famous Robert Frost poem, when I was going the yellow wood, the road diverged, I, I pick the road that was less traveled by. Uh, pick the lonely road if you want to become famous. <laughs> <laughs> Any further questions? Yes, Here's from back here. My own work or somebody else's? Well, well, you know, I tell you, for me, I've been working on oxides for a very long time, for those who may not know, the last 50, 55 years. Uh, in 1986, uh, there was a symposium on valence fluctuation. You may not know that. Uh, Phil Anderson, Nobel laureate from Princeton, he gave a lecture on the physics of electric fluctuation. I was asked to give on the chemistry and valence fluctuation. I gave the lecture. Soon after that, he came rushing to me. He said, never forget this incident in my life. Professor, I want to talk to you. I said, what is it? Do you know there's a new high temperature superconductor? He said, is that right? I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, you know, it is 35K. Really? I thought 23 was the highest uh, I, I knew at that time. No, 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 it is 23K. Do you know what material? Yeah, that is why I want to talk to you. There is something called lanthanum copper. You mean LA2CuO4 maybe? Yeah, yeah, there's something like that. He said. In fact, you know, I had worked on that in 1971. In fact, all referees used to make fun of me. Why are you wasting your time working on layered oxide? But I used to publish these papers on layered oxide, and lanthanum copper oxide being one. Unfortunately, they had not studied any properties at low temperatures. Uh, otherwise, uh, <laughs> so, and so immediately what happened, I tell you, the entire world said, look, 35K is no good. We should make something at liquid nitrogen temperature. So I also started doing that. Though, of course, Chu and uh, here in this country, uh, he said something about, he published a paper, he never mentioned what the material was. Independently, three people published the structure and properties together, Bell Labs, uh, Kava, and uh, Zhao in China, and myself in Bangalore. We all published in Nature, I published in Nature, March 1971, YBA2, YBA2C307. That was very exciting. The day I saw the diamagnetic signal of YBA2C307, my God, I couldn't believe it. Uh, we have made it in Bangalore. You know, it's like, these are all many things like that. Uh, very exciting things uh, uh, in, uh, in my life. But that was one of the exciting periods, no doubt about that. No doubt about that. This one over here, Dave. Professor Rao, um, you showed us some really exciting new results on hydrogen production and other energy applications for these inorganic graphene analogs. I was just wondering, what your vision is really for the challenges facing the, uh, our, this generation of scientists for the energy production and what materials you think would be the most uh, yeah. applicable? Yeah. Uh, I, I think, you know, in my own opinion, but I seriously think we should somehow crack the problem of hydrogen storage. Uh, we, somehow I think we'll change, we'll be able to solve the problem of production, either by photosynthesis, the other kind I do, or some other way. How to store it is a problem. Because all the cars that they have now are using hydrogen cylinders. We want to get rid of that. We want to use the hydrogen storage. I think that is a very, very important uh, problem. Even the fuel cell technology, to be honest, even, even though fuel cell technology is advanced, I can't, for example, suppose Oak Ridge wants to have, forget about electricity like this, ordinary, we have, we want the entire campus by fuel cell, say, have a five megawatt fuel cell supply. It, it is not yet possible. So I think we must have large-scale fuel cell packages, for particularly countries like India. It would be wonderful. I will have two megawatt uh, units in my lab and take care of it. 
but we, we still don't have that. There are many such challenges uh, in that. And batteries, we still continue to have batteries. We still work on lithium, and lithium is in short supply. We must find better batteries. Let's see, there was another hand yes. up. Okay, over here. Uh, I was very happy to hear that these uh, materials finally are on the open. My PhD degree was on uh, graphene and boronitrate and other structures of uh, similar materials uh, because Borazone contained the same amount of electrons as two carbons, and they form the same type of material structures. They have diamond-type yes. structure. They have um, graphene-type graphene of structure, and they form the same type of polymers. But the properties are totally different and my PhD degree was to explain why they are different and to predict other materials. And I did this, and I'm very happy to hear that you have this boron nitrate carbon uh, and that the properties are so extraordinary. Based on my theory, I can tell you if you dot the material with something, what kind of properties you, you can expect, electrical properties, uh, magnetic properties, sure. and uh, mechanical properties. Mm -hmm. So the Russian cosmic station, which is international cosmic station now, is built with such materials, boronitrates, polymer. Thank you. Uh, they are using computers now, to powerful computer to um, find out certain dopant, what influence will have on the properties. And based on my simple theory, I can predict quite well what to expect in advance mm -hmm. without yeah. computers. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay. What I'd like to do now is, is present you um, with a token of our appreciation, and this is the, the uh, Vigner uh, plaque for your lecture. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. Before we go, I'd like to um, thank everybody for coming, and I hope that you'll take advantage of reviewing his lecture on, on the, the video that we just completed. Uh, and I'd like to remind you that the next Vigner lecture is on November the 2nd, and it will be Francis Arnold, who is a professor in protein design from Caltech. So we look forward to seeing you again. And I'd like to thank the, the, the corporate fellows for organizing this and the other uh, Vigner lectures. And uh, we'll continue to have some just spectacular people like Dr. Rao come and tell us about their career and their science. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.